Nick Bartia, welcome back to What Bitcoin Did, mate. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Pete. It's great to see you. Great to be here. It's always great to see you. And uh, anyone watching, if you can see, Nick's got some brand new Jordans he wants you all to see. <laughs> Show them up. Show them to the camera. Actually, they're not new. Oh, they're not new. But they are my favorite fours right now. I Do you know I collect trainers? I didn't know that. Yeah, I've got one. I think one pair of Jordans. I'll show them later. They're pretty cool. Anyway, man, how you been? I'm doing great. It's been a few months since I've seen you. So you, uh, Miami, no, Malibu last time. Yeah, Malibu. Yeah. yeah, man. All right, well, listen, look, last couple of years have been very exciting for you. Um, I've known you since uh, I came to LA that time, popped up to the Open Node office. 2019. 2019, you'd written a couple of articles, then you wrote a book. Now you've got a whole goddamn business. Uh, you're killing it. You've got employees or employee. Um, tell me about that. How's that been going, man? It's been going great. So we launched the Bitcoin layer. Well, I launched the Bitcoin layer in September 21. So it's been just about a year now. And I started it as just a research publication once a week, writing my thoughts on macro, what's going on with Bitcoin and the Fed and that whole relationship. I was writing that for, I don't know, about six, nine months. And then I realized that I was loving it so much. And I wanted to turn it from, let's call it a hobbyist newsletter into a full research media company. And so in June, May, June, I hired two people, Joe Consorti and Matthew Ball. So Joe helps me with the research and he helps me write, do charts, things like that. And Matt is helping with the YouTube side. So we launched a YouTube channel in June and we're doing videos that are along the lines of what we're writing about in the publication, Bitcoin macro, but a little bit more on the educational side. So really breaking things down and uh, explaining them to, let's say, a non-finance background type of person, whereas the Substack publication is definitely more for people that are invested across asset classes and are looking for, um, you know, the the high signal macro content. So I got Joe, Matt, uh, we got a great little team of three and we're building the Substack and the YouTube channel and everyone can go find us at thebitcoinlayer.com. We will show all of that in the show notes. We have Joe with us. You want to say hello, Joe? Hello. We have Joe with us. And, and Pete, before I forget, I uh, have this hat for you i know you like to wear hats so the bitcoin like layer that's and, amazing uh, thank you I, if i didn't know i'd have brought a, a rail bedford hat for you that's very cool that's very kind of you well next time and i got my i got my tbl merch going on right here and i'm gonna wear this in one of the interviews this week thank you that's very kind man are you selling merch yeah absolutely bitcoinlayer.com we got the merch section as well so t-shirts hoodies hats everything Dan like that danny they're ahead of us they are ahead of us well you know this is what the competition does. <laughs> or beat us. <laughs> I, I thought back to, um, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I started getting into macro. And I actually purchased a Zero Hedge hoodie in the year 2010 or 2011. And when we were, we were deciding to do merch, I had these flashbacks of, I was like, yeah, I, you know, people will wear their favorite macro publication merch. I did it. So why not other people? Well, Zero Hedge is a very cool brand as well. So you have to you have to develop it up. And it's changed a lot over the years, but I I always try to credit Zero Hedge with being one of the first publications on the internet that was really focused on Fed transparency, letting us know what the Fed and the primary dealers were up to in the intricacies and in the details, and not just what we were getting on CNBC or Bloomberg. And that was before I had access to sell side Wall Street research. So Bloom, um, Zero Hedge was pretty much the only place I could go to get truth and facts about the Fed. But it's it's evolved into more of a pay to play platform with a lot of junk, but still there is signal in there if you look close enough. Like what a journey, man, from uh, traditional finance into now our world of Bitcoin finance, the cross section of uh, uh, macro and Bitcoin and your own business. It's incredible. I've loved watching it. I, I feel like I've been with you across the whole journey and and uh it's incredible to see so congratulations thank you so much amazing work okay um as you know we did an interview with jeff snyder recently and uh it was quite well received in that not everyone agreed but it caused a lot of debate a lot of discussion uh 
as ever, there were some concepts in there that have been hard to get around. I mean, me and Danny have discussed this euro dollar thing relentlessly thing, uh, re- relentlessly since because it is such a complicated subject. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and uh, it's a really kind of a weird part of the finance world that I didn't know existed. And I feel like it impacts our lives uh, negatively. Uh, and then you reached out to us and you were like, Pete, I want to want to come and respond to this. Uh, you, it's not anti Jeff. I, I know you, he's influenced you a lot, but do you want to explain why you reached out? What is what was it about that show that made you want to come back on? Well, my readers and listeners reached out to me after that show, and they said, "Nick, you got to respond. We want to know what you think about some of these concepts that Jeff is talking about." And I I don't know if they were looking for me to strongly agree, strongly disagree, or just comment on it, but. Jeff Snyder's Euro dollar research was integral in my research for writing layered money. So chapter five of my book, where I get into a little bit of the history of the Euro dollar and its evolution, I took a lot of Jeff's research and learned from it and then used it as a springboard to learn more about the system. So I you know, want to start with just acknowledging that Jeff's research about the euro dollar has like zero hedge it brought a lot of these concepts that were in the dark corners out into the public and especially this idea that the euro dollar system as a parallel system has an outsized impact on the world the way that global markets work and the economy as well so i want to start with that but you know more specifically i think that the way that Jeff describes the euro dollar system, it, it, there's more to be said there. And what I like to think about the euro dollar system is that we have this dollar, right? That's the denomination of the world. But we have onshore dollars and offshore dollars, and the offshore dollar system has actually grown to a point where it has now the most impact on the global economy relative to like what the Fed is doing, for example. Well, c- can we jump back a touch? Because some of the people listening to this won't have listened to the Jeff Snyder show. Um, I will encourage them. We'll put it in the show notes. But um, it might be a good idea to just like go to the basis of what or the basics of what the euro dollar system is. Because prior to doing the show with Jeff, I'd heard of the euro dollar. I ex- assumed it was just like some exchange rate uh, measurement. I didn't actually know it was this system of offshore dollars. Um, but it'd be good to just Give the absolute basics to people what it is uh, and why it exists. Why, why did it come about? Sure. So, and that's a, another thing about Jeff's interview. Because the euro dollar system is opaque, there is an unwillingness to say where it came from, what it is, and he played around with the words a little bit. But we really can trace the origin of the euro dollar system to the pro- post Bretton Woods world in which the dollar is the reserve currency, but dollars didn't exist enough outside the United States. So people needed to borrow dollars to do trade finance. They also needed to find a place to store their dollars outside of New York. So the Soviets storing their dollars in London and Paris banks, and let's say Germany, France, trying uh, companies trying to rebuild Europe and needing to borrow in dollars in order to get the economy moving again. So it's just this need for dollars outside of the United States once the dollar had become the currency that was agreed upon. So it, it, it wasn't any conspiracy or even planning by the banks. It's just a natural evolution of money that uh, if you need to finance your trade, we will lend you dollars to do that because the, per- the company you're purchasing from will only accept dollars. They won't accept Italian lira. They won't accept French francs. They only want dollars. And so how do you get those dollars outside of the United States? A bank has to lend them into existence. So there's a couple of questions I have with that. Well, firstly, it's a point. Uh, I didn't actually realize at the time with uh, Jeff, one of the things that wasn't really clear to me is that it, it was the it was this existence of dollars outside of the U.S., but I hadn't made the connection. It's because the dollar was the global reserve currency, and I don't even know if he mentioned it was a post Bretton Woods thing. But it hadn't kind of clicked for me that this was it. This was the fact that uh, 
it's especially in trade and finance, like the dollar is the world's reserve currency. And so that, you know, that was where it was required. But the question I really had was, if I want to go to a bank in the UK and borrow pounds, uh, I can be lent those pounds, but those those banks have to have a banking license to do that. They have to operate within the infrastructure of the UK. For banks to be able to accept and use dollars globally outside of the US, do they have to have a similar kind of license with the US? See, and that's where the euro dollar system got out of control because no, there, there's there's two things here. There's the issuance of dollars outside the US, and then there's the question of fungibility of those outside the US dollars and onshore dollars. So the first question is, the answer is no. Basically, if a British bank wants to lend dollars, it doesn't have to adhere to any dollar reserve ratios. It can just issue those dollars and lend those dollars into existence. And that's what happened over the course of the 50s to 2007, is that you had an issuance that was unregulated and basically unwatched and totally opaque. As that issuance grew over half a century, it finally busted. And so from 07 to 09, when that system went bust, what Snyder's talking about in terms of deflation and contraction, that is what we have in the offshore dollar system post 07, is we have a contraction of this activity, which dollars get lent into existence outside the United States with no reserve requirements or no reserve ratios. That has tapered itself over the last 15 years. But before that, from the 50s to 07, it was completely out of control, unregulated, opaque, and it ended up being so much. I mean, the quantity of dollars ended up being so much that it put all this banking risk in your concentrated banking risk in Europe, for example, and that problem of bad debts on the books. Because like Lynn talked about this as well in the post Snyder episode, the it's not that they don't have any reserve requirements. It's that when they lend those dollars into existence, the assets that they have that they've marked are loans. So if the loans are good loans, then they'll get paid back that money plus interest and everything is fine. But if they're bad loans, then the assets that they have have to be written down from 100 to 80 to 60. Then they're taking losses on the asset side of their balance sheet and then they're facing solvency issues. So that's what we've seen with European banks basically since 2009 is that European banks have a lot of bad debt on their books and they're not really able to get out of that situation. Right. Let me explain the bit I don't understand and sure. see if you can help me with this. Okay. So, Danny, what are the reserve ratios for UK banks? Do we know what they are? I don't know. I can have a look. Just call it 10%. I mean, okay, 10%. it's pretty global standard. So, the way I understand fractional reserve banking is I go to my bank, I want to buy a house, they lend me £500,000, knowing they have collateral themselves of, say, 50000 that that allows them to do that, right? Great. That's fine. I can borrow that money. And that in that fractional reserve system... As, as long as there's, you know, as long as everything's kind of okay, it just kind of works. But in a scenario whereby, say, there's fears over uh, a, a bank, maybe it has bad debts, maybe there's just questions about it. We always hear of a run on the bank where people are going in to try and get their money historically, or you even see it, you know, you've even seen it on the TV recently with banks in various countries where they want the cash. And so I understand that when there's a run on the bank, there is enough cash, the bank can default and you, you can lose your money. That I fully understand that scenario. But they do have those kind of reserves that is allows them to make the loans. What I don't understand in this euro dollar system, if there's no reserves or no reserve ratio, what are they lending against? Are they are they literally just printing numbers? And when they do, say this bank prints a million dollars because they want to lend it to you, Nick, when they transfer it to you. What is the settlement between them and the bank receiving it? Do you understand my question? Sure. So let me try to explain it. So the first question about reserves. So the bank, when it lends 500,000 pounds, or let's say a British bank is lending dollars. 
so they're euro dollar lending that bank is likely to own us treasuries maybe to 10% of the amount that they're lending in dollars okay so they have their own reserve ratios and their own risk management so they do it's not like they don't have any reserves they they are likely to have some us dollar cash some us treasury securities other uh, us dollar denominated assets so they do have some reserves there but let's go to the 2000s real quick it's not, it wasn't just the lending that we we're talking about that got out of control it wasn't just you know lending to people against their homes and all that kind of stuff it was the underwriting of derivatives and like credit default swaps for example uh foreign exchange swaps all these basically contracts these are contracts when they get uh, agreed upon by a bank and a counterparty. There's no money that exchanges hands at the beginning of that contract. There's just exposure now. So when rates move or when currencies move, then that contract has a mark to market loss or gain for the bank, right? They wrote so many contracts during the 2000s that it, it almost didn't matter how much they had lent in the normal offshore dollar economy. They had all this derivatives exposure. The notional amount was above $10 trillion, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but the market, actual market value of these, all these contracts was almost a trillion dollars. This is a, a, according to the Bank of International Settlements numbers. So all of, all of those contracts made them exposed to dollar losses without reserves, right? Because if you're just writing derivatives contracts left and right, those banks during the 2000s especially were not reserving anything against those losses. They weren't even hedging them properly. So, so you essentially issue in a form of credit. That's right. It's a, it's a form of credit. And even those uh, derivatives contracts are forms of credit. And so I think that in listening to the last couple episodes, talking about the dollar, euro dollar, I think what you need to understand about when, let's say, Barclays lends a uh, million dollars to a British company, okay? The British company, the, the million dollars didn't exist before, and now it exists. The British company has a million dollars in their, in their checking account now, right? The liability of the bank, but the asset of the company, because now they have a million dollars. The company also has a million dollars in debt, right? They owe a million dollars back to the bank, but they have a million dollars in their checking account. Now, if that company wants to grow their business, let's say they write a check for a quarter million to their supplier, that quarter million then goes from, now you have 750,000 in your checking account for that British business, and now let's say it's a French supplier. The French company at BNP Paribas now has 250,000 in their checking account. And then that supplier goes and spends that money. So that money, gets into the real economy. Every time you spend, it has nothing to do with cash or paper money or even reserve ratios. The money is in the, in the checking account of the business. The business spends it, sends it to France. The French supplier takes that money, sends it to North Africa for their supplier. And the money just makes it out into the checking accounts of the world of banks that deal in offshore dollars. And okay. so- all of that money that is created by Barclays on day one does find its way into the rest of the economy. It will be a component for aggregate demand, right? Aggregate demand just means what is the world buying, right? Every year or every day, that's the aggregate demand of the world. So the aggregate demand of the world will go up when Barclays issues that million dollars, assuming that that million dollars is going to get spent. And so that is how the issuance of offshore dollars makes its way into the global economy. It is a significant uh, contributor to the overall aggregate demand of the world. It especially was from the 50s to 09. And um, then the issue back to the fungibility issue that's really, I think, the most complicated part about, about all of this uh, euro dollar stuff. 
it's that if you have, uh, you know, the BIS has quoted $13 trillion of offshore, or let's say dollar denominated loans issued by banks outside the United States. So that's the very minimum amount of Euro dollars that we know that exist. There are definitely more, but at a very minimum, there's 13 trillion that have been lent into existence by non-US banks in a dollar denomination. So those 13 trillion dollars, could you could you transfer that money back into the United States into an onshore bank and contribute to the aggregate demand of the US? I think the answer is yes, but that fungibility is I think one of the more complicated topics to understand. And especially for me, when I was writing layered money, trying to understand the relationship between offshore dollar issuance and the gold peg breaking in 1968, 1971, however you want to uh, classify that, that was also very difficult to articulate because was the issuance of offshore dollars the main driver of the depletion of U.S. gold reserves in, in New York and in Fort Knox? Maybe, maybe not. I couldn't commit to making that claim. And so instead, I just showed the timeline that, hey, this is what happened in the growth of euro dollars. Then eventually the gold peg did break because gold reserves were being depleted in the United States the Triffin dilemma, the Triffin paradox that is discussed a lot. The Triffin's dilemma is this idea that if the global reserve currency is the dollar and dollar reserves are amassed outside of the U.S., those dollar reserves will come for U.S. gold, deplete the gold on uh, the U.S. gold, and that is a problem. And so it did happen can we 100% attribute it to the euro dollar issuance? I'm not sure. I, I don't have a great answer for that. But I know that that is part of history where we have to think about was the euro dollar system, just this issuance of dollars around the world, was it the main driver of the gold stock of the US falling and then the eventual closing of the gold window? All right. So I've got a couple of questions with that as well. So like I'm a big fan of physical money. I I always have physical money. Uh, I I fear the day where we go completely cashless. Um, I keep little stores of physical money in the world uh, for in case I ever need it. Uh, in a world of only physical money, this kind of credit expansion can't really happen if that's the only money you have without physically printing more dollars. If you had to settle everything at the time with the cash, you can't have this. Am I right in thinking about that? I think you are because um, it's not like euro dollars have any physical form. Hmm. And that's how they were able to get issued. Because let's say, go back to our, our British company example. They are issued a million dollar loan by Barclays. The next day, they go into their Barclays app and they see a million dollars in their account. Then they go to the Barclays branch and they say, can I withdraw? 100,000 US dollars, physical paper currency. The Barclays would say, no, we don't have it. We, we, you know, we don't have it. We, we're not able to give you that. But if there was a physical component to it, Barclays and BNP Paribas and other European banks would have their own printing press with their own little Christine Lagarde face on the middle of the note. And those, those paper notes would have value in the economy. Company, um, you know, let's say companies would accept it because they know that if I take these notes to Barclays, Barclays will credit my account with a deposit. But it, because it now has a different form, it might have an exchange rate to the dollar, like ninety nine cents or dollar one, because there's a market now for physical notes. There would be a black market. Hey. I'll trade you this Christine Lagarde for that Benjamin, and there will be an exchange rate there hand-to-hand. -hand. That exchange rate will make its way into public knowledge because markets are transparent. We, we know the price of Bitcoin on classified ads in, on local Bitcoins in different countries. We know it's not the spot price 
that we see and we know for a fact that's actually way higher than the spot price because of foreign exchange risk and other risks that are involved in purchasing Bitcoin hand-to-hand in currency that's not U.S. dollars. Because whoever's selling you that Bitcoin is accepting, let's say, Turkish lira. That seller of Bitcoin doesn't know what that lira is going to buy in terms of dollars in the next hour, in the next 24 hours, in the next seven days. It has no idea. So it has to charge a 30%, 50% premium just to protect his, his book from naked exposure and naked losses. I know it's a little bit of a side. Uh, no, no, but I, I understand. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like what I was trying to get to is like, if, if this room was the entirety of the economy, and we all had, I don't know, a hundred dollars each, and I wanted to buy something for you, this uh, early morning beer, and if I bought it from you, and say you sold it me for ten dollars, you would have a hundred ten dollars, I'd have ninety, but there's still the same amount of money exists. But if I go to you and say, ah. Uh, can I buy that beer off you? But I can. Can I pay that later? I, I I accumulate the beer, the debt exists, but I still have the money, and that's and then I can go and then spend it with Danny, and that to me is like that was the real kind of light bulb moment. I was like, huh, this is what creates the credit expansion, and this is what essentially drives the inflation because it allows us to go and buy other things that that we didn't have the money for, which increases the, the the demand on goods. I mean, that kind of like little simple scenario. I was like, oh, I, I get it now. Now, if you look at what's been happening in terms of you know, global finance of the last, you know, let's say just last two decades, even the last 15 years since the uh, financial crisis, it's been that on crack. <laughs> Absolutely. And all money is credit money. That's really the, the the world that we live in. All of it is credit money. Anything that comes from a bank, the word deposit itself is credit money. And so the whole system that we have across the world and for the last, let's say, since 1968, but even even going back before that, has always really been a credit money system. It is why people are drawn to Bitcoin because it's not a credit money system. There is no credit component to Bitcoin. It's a commodity. It's physical money, right? You you like physical money. Well, the keys that you have in your wallet, that's physical money too, right? It's uh, abstract, but it is physical because it's yours and it's not a counterparty instrument, layered money, right? It's not, it's not a second layer of money. And it's a first layer of money. But for the whole, the rest of the world and all the banking system, it is, it's just a credit money system. Now the credit money system does help finance expansion. It also contributes to the cycle because you have expansion of credit and then you have contraction of credit. So when contraction of credit happens, you have a slowdown in the economy. And when you have an expansion in credit, you have growth in the economy because people are spending. The system that we have today, I don't feel like it's going anywhere. It will stay. Banks are, uh, you know, power players in this world. They're not going to relinquish their position very easily. And it's also why I believe that comparing Bitcoin to the dollar, quote unquote, the dollar is a terrible comparison. Bitcoin is an asset. The dollar is a credit money system. They're not apples to apples. Bitcoin can be compared to gold like a commodity. It can even be compared to real estate or even stocks. But to compare it to the dollar is a terrible comparison. Because of scarcity. Because the dollar has lost most of its definition. Per the Constitution of the United States, the dollar was an amount of gold or an amount of silver, fixed exchange rates, That changed in the year 1900 where they eliminated silver and adjusted the gold price based off of the dollar in 1900. That was a gold standard act of 1900. But since then, and especially once we get into the 50s and then post-1971, the dollar has lost its definition. You cannot, like Jeff Snyder says, you can't describe money. People don't know how to describe money. Try actually defining the dollar. You won't be able to do it in a simple way anymore. It's not, it's, the dollar isn't a thing anymore. 
It's just a denomination of our credit money system. You can't take a dollar and exchange it for anything with the government. It's a Federal Reserve note, first of all. It's no longer a U.S. Treasury instrument. That happened in 1913 when the Fed took over as the central bank of the United States. Before that, paper currency in the United States said U.S. Treasury on top. And it said, I promise to pay the bearer $10 of gold coin on demand. That used to be a dollar. You could define a dollar more easily 120 years ago. But the definition of a dollar is, is impossible now. So how can you compare Bitcoin to the dollar? What is the dollar? It's a denomination. What is Bitcoin? It's a numeric commodity. So they're very, very different. What is gold? Gold is a physical commodity. So there's a comparison there. What is real estate? Real estate is ownership of property with you know scarce, like at least some idea of scarcity, how much land, 57 million square miles, uh, you know, I know that land can be built up or even offshore. These are like little nitpicks of the thesis here that Bitcoin is more comparable to real estate than it is to the dollar. And what about stocks? Stocks represent an ownership over, call it a network, but a company, ownership over the future cash flows of that company. So Bitcoin is ownership of a slice of a network that has utility for the rest of the world. You're not accruing Bitcoin to your own Bitcoin position just because people are using Bitcoin. Um, maybe the Lightning Network, you can, but just for Bitcoin itself, it's a commodity, it's property, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ownership claim, but it's not anything to do with credit. And it does have this uh, denomination aspect in common with Bitcoin, but and in terms of the dollar in Bitcoin, but that's about where it stops. So I wrote a piece at the Bitcoin layer a few months ago called um, Bitcoin and the dollar. What was it called again? The Bi Bitcoin and the dollar are not the same or Bitcoin versus quote unquote the dollar. Okay. Okay. And then I did a, a, a YouTube video uh, a couple weeks later after it. The, the thesis here is that compare Bitcoin to gold, stocks, real estate, or even bonds, but don't compare it to the dollar. The the two are just completely apples and oranges. I think the reason people do that, though, is because when they think of money, they think of the dollar. And then when they think of Bitcoin, well, I'm using it as money, so therefore it's comparable. But you're talking about almost the definition of where, uh, where its value comes from. So let's go into the word currency. Yeah. Currency comes from current, right, which is a flow. Electrical currents go from one piece of the board to the other piece of the board, right? And then something happens. Currency is the same concept. It's a flow. So the dollar does flow as a currency, as does Bitcoin. So the comparison of Bitcoin to the word currency, I think is accurate. And comparing the dollar or saying the dollar is a currency is also accurate. So if somebody thinks of this is the dollar currency and this is the Bitcoin currency, they're both called currency. Calling them both currency is appropriate. Therefore, people compare them. But and not money. What is the dollar? It's not money per se. It's a credit instrument, mostly. It's not a commodity. So then, then when you actually dive a little bit deeper and get out of, out of the word currency and define it deeper, then the comparisons start to fall apart. And I understand that people compare Bitcoin to the dollar all the time because they're both currencies. So it's an acceptable comparison at the surface, but really when you dig deeper into it, it's, it's not a good comparison. C can we jump back also and do a little bit of a history lesson here? Um, talk about Bretton Woods and why it happened. Why, why did the gold standard end? And what was the benefit to the US being the global reserve currency as opposed to, wasn't there originally pitched like a basket of goods, a basket of currencies? The, I think there was even a shit coin named after it at some point. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, so why did it happen? Oh, I know and what you yeah. Yeah, and, what, and why, did the, why was it beneficial to the US? So the 1929 uh, yeah. stock market crash, right? We had the depression in the 30s. 
what you started to see during that era was countries devaluing their currency versus gold, right? The competitive mm -hmm. devaluation versus gold to make their products appear cheaper to the rest of the world to attract demand. So a competitive devaluation around the world in the 30s motivated countries to come together and said, this has to stop. We have to figure out some sort of fixed exchange rate regime. So let's make the dollar the only currency that you can trade for gold. And let's make all the local currencies in France, Britain, et cetera, let's make all of those have a fixed exchange rate with the dollar so that the only link between government currency and gold is at the U.S. level. And we are going to stop doing that sort of convertibility all around the world. So from a layered money perspective, gold on the first layer, U.S. dollar on the second layer, and then every other currency on the third layer. Have you, have you got that, Danny? Yeah, yeah we've, we've got, got the chart that you did. We got this prepared. All the, all the pyramid. We knew this was going to come up. Um, and and that was done with good intentions, and rightly so. That I mean, it's it solved a real problem. Well, competitive gold devaluation was a was a de, was a genuine competitive problem. gold devaluation was a real problem. But then once you started, the, this is the one before Bretton Woods, right? This is just this is the um, convertibility of pounds, francs, and marks and dollars to gold. This is the situation that was before the competitive devaluation. Okay, so this is, this is uh, just for people listening, we're, we're going to have a few charts up. If you haven't checked out the YouTube, we'll just explain them. But Nick creates these pyramids which explain the layers of money, hence layered money, his book, and hence the Bitcoin layer, his company. Now, so this is uh, essentially the layers of money prior to what we're talking about, whereby you have gold at the top, then you have the central banks, and then you have the various currencies. So explain the functioning of this. Yeah, so uh, if you have, let's say, uh, British pounds in yes. the 1930s, you could take those pounds to the bank or the central bank and exchange it for gold. Okay. After 1944, that's no longer the case. Now British pounds only have an exchange rate with dollars, and only dollars have an exchange rate with gold. So you could take your pounds to a gold dealer and purchase gold at the market price from that gold dealer. But in terms of the re uh, redeemability of that note for physical gold, the post Bretton uh, Woods world ended that. So that only US dollar currency could be exchanged. And that brought in the Triffin's dilemma, the Triffin's paradox, which said, wait, if only the dollar can be exchanged for gold, and what's going to happen to the gold of the U.S. once dollars start stacking up outside of the United States? They're going to take our gold. And it is what happened. And it is why the U.S. and European countries in 1961 started this idea of the gold pool, which was a, a, a gold price suppression scheme, basically, in a way to uh, keep, keep the gold price from rising. Then in 1968, they basically ended the gold pool because they realized that they wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Right. You can't just print gold. So it's the, it's the expansion of the money which destroyed the gold standard. It is the singularity of U.S. gold stock being the base, being the first layer of money for the entire globe that set it up in a way that the, the lower layers of money expanded so great and the gold stock is only so small that that relationship became untenable and the United States government had to protect their gold stock at a certain point and just say, we have to eliminate the link between gold and government currency. Forget the dollar, just everything, because otherwise we're, we're going to lose our gold. And we're confident we can survive without gold as our first layer of money and continue to be a global powerhouse, and they were right. As 50 years later, the U.S. is still the number one economy in the world, and the margin has, has probably grown. But thinking in terms of my analogy, is, is, this room is, is the world. It's you, me, Danny, Jeremy, and Joe. We have $100 each, but we also have our own little uh, 
central bank of gold and say we have five ounces of gold and the convertibility is 100 ounces for a gold. So whatever happens, as long as we're spending with each other and you're receiving your dollars and I'm receiving mine, at any point if we want to go and get our gold, we can. And that is a perfectly contained system that can't break. But at the point we digitize our money, and I uh, turn around to you, Nick, and say, oh, I want to buy that stuff of you. I'll, I'll owe you later. I've created that credit. Now, that credit allows me to go and make a claim on that gold. And at some point, that gold will run out. And even though you've got $100, you can't go and claim it. So essentially, that's what we've done on a, on a global scale. That's right. And that's, yeah. what, that's why that situation uh, ended in 1971. It was, a, it was an archaic system. It was a sound system in theory, but it broke. And this idea of sound money, and I want to talk to you about this a little bit today in terms of the Fed uh, being, you know, uh, having its response the way that it has this year with hiking rates. But this idea of sound money is, is an old concept that people are grasping onto today because they realize that this layered money system has nothing, nothing at the top that is physical. It was even raised by the opposition leader in the UK, Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party. Part of his uh, recent, they have these party political conferences. Uh, I can't remember what they call them, but the, Labour had their big conference. And one of the things he wanted to do, a, a long list of things, he also talked about making money sound again. Can you find that, Danny? See, yeah, have a look. See if you can find the reference to it, which I thought was like, huh, yeah, well, Labour stand. Listen, <clears throat> this is the FT. Labour stands for sound money, Starmer to tell party conference. Without even reading this, my assumption is he's going to talk about the quality of money and responsibility of money. But not he's not going to talk about money as sound in the way you're going to talk about it in sound. But let's just, I'm just going to have a read of this. Uh, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer will use his conference speech on Tuesday to tell British voters he stands for sound money. Didn't say Bitcoin. As he seeks to take the mantle, blah, blah, blah. He will criticize Quasi Quartan's tax cut in high borrowing mini budget, which rattled markets and sent sterling to historic lows. The plan is to set out a range of tax cuts, blah, blah, blah. We've seen the government in the past few days have no precedent. Precedent. They've lost control of the British economy. So when I, th I think, I mean, without even reading the rest, my assumption is when I'm talking about sound money, he's talking about uh, responsible economic policy. He's not talking about sound money. Yes. And, um, I, that's also what I meant by the Fed is that sound money for the Fed doesn't mean going back to buying gold and uh, reducing the, um, or sorry, increasing the reserve requirements and all that kind of stuff with gold at the bottom. But what, what central banks are talking about now or even governments for sound money is a situation where the fiscal picture is cleaner than in previous years, because how does a government operate? It has tax revenue, and then it has a spend. So the difference is either it's deficit or it's surplus. And as surplus, the, what is that? What, yeah, is, what exactly. is a surplus? So as Wait, for, can you go and look at find out when we last had a surplus? Yeah, uh, the Clinton White House. Oh, really? Interesting. Is that why Clinton was so confident to uh, repeal Klaus Stiegel and? open up lending? No. It wasn't? No. Glass-Steagall being dismantled was the investment banks yes. wanting, to, wanting to get more involved. And their lobbyists and Larry Jeffrey Epstein Summers <laughs> and uh, people like that got involved and said, hey, this is what we need for um, growth in the financial sector. But but also tied to that, didn't they change the borrowing rates and the requirements for um, lending to people to be able to get mortgages? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I, thought, I thought that was linked. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought that was linked. Yeah, but it has nothing to do with a fiscal surplus. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I didn't know if it's a time where you feel like there's an economic boom. Let's, you know, this is a democratic party. Let's get more people into housing. It was to, the idea was to open up housing to those on low incomes. I didn't know if the, my assumption is that at a time of boom and surplus, yeah, let's try and get people into houses. Yeah, so you know, a pro housing um, U.S. Uh, Congress and executive branch has gone across the aisle, both sides, and has been there for for many years, oh, really okay. since the beginning of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, when. Uh, single-family home ownership became a nationwide 
policy and goal of both parties. And huh. so that led to Fannie and Freddie, and that's why Fannie and Freddie, even post-2008, when they went essentially bankrupt and went into conservatorship, that's why we don't see either party trying to make that many changes to the agency. And by agency, I mean Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, these agency lenders and their place and their special uh, role in the government. Um, because it's really a bipartisan effort to try to get people into homes. It's like a pro-American right. dream sort of effort. And the Fed, when, so back to the sound money, with the Fed raising rates to 4% from zero this year is their effort to do sound money because it is rewarding savers, let's say, instead of promoting uh, borrowing and speculation. So it's their effort to get uh, a more sound currency and one that people doubt a lot less because what happened is post- Doubt a lot less. Doubt a lot less because <laughs> in from 2009 to 2021, the Fed printed $8 trillion, right? Mm -hmm. And by print, I mean they created $8 trillion in bank reserves and those bank reserves went out and purchased U.S. treasuries and mortgages. It brought borrowing costs down net on net for home home buyers, and it was it had stimulative effect, um, at least in the confidence of uh, the economy. Right, consumer behavior, consumers actually go out and spend when they see QE because of confidence. They think that, oh, things are gonna get better. I'll go out and spend. There's this portfolio effect that banks take uh, the cash that they now have that used to be for treasuries, and then they'll go buy stocks with it. That'll send stock prices up. People will feel wealthier and they'll, they'll go buy money. All of that uh, monetary profligacy over the last 10 years put the Fed's reputation on watch. Everybody and their mother knows about the Fed and its willingness to just do QE infinity. And so in a post-pandemic world where um, they got caught basically uh, without a plan, now they have to preserve their reputation. And I do believe that at the margin, there is a small component there that I think Bitcoin has contributed to this. The Fed looked at the Bitcoin price at $70,000 late last year. And they're like, we got to, we're losing to Bitcoin. How can this be? Let's raise rates to 4% and crush that thing. And let's get some of the sound money narrative back toward us away from Bitcoin. Really, I'm, really though? Like really they saw... Bitcoin at 70,000 and thought, let's raise the rates and crush it. Or really, was it inflation's running? I mean, inflation's running wild. So inflation running wild is the mandate. Yeah. And so that's what they have to say in the media. But if you read what the Fed is talking about with asset prices, they're actually trying to drive stocks down so right now. General asset prices, Bitcoin alongside other asset prices. But to think that the Fed is not looking at Bitcoin and oh, no, scared. Oh, I agree. Okay, so even, so I'm not saying it's the main driver, Yeah, but they have to be looking at Bitcoin as a judgment on themselves. And so they see $70,000 Bitcoin above 1 trillion in market cap, and all of a sudden the narrative that Bitcoin is going to replace the dollar starts to gain steam, right? And, you know, you're in a, post-pandemic bailout, QE infinity, the dollar is collapsing, that it's the death of the dollar, um, let's buy Bitcoin. The Fed is like, no, but it's not the death of the dollar and watch us. And so I'm not saying that Bitcoin is even the, even the main driver, one of the biggest drivers of the higher interest rate policy. But it's but part it, of it. It does yeah. contribute to their desire to protect their reputation. So, okay, fine. And interest rates have gone up in the UK as well. And two things I saw today, uh, house prices have dropped for 
uh, I think the second or third month in a row. And also a consumer spending at retail, retail spending is its lowest since the pandemic. So, uh, and there can be a wide range of reasons for this. There is you know, inflation and such, but usually when this happens, they reduce interest rates and print more money. So would you say that the Bank of England, the Fed are finally allowing a contraction to happen because they haven't allowed it previously. They've kicked the can down the road. We've we've gone gone other times of surpluses and deficits. It's stimulate, stimulate, stimulate until the point where they can't stimulate anymore. Do you believe they're going to allow a full contraction, or do you believe this is a temporary and they're going to start printing again? That is the um, eighty three trillion dollar question that you're asking. <laughs> Two point four quad. <laughs> what, 2.1 quadrillion sats question. Is That's it right. quadrillion? Well, it's actually slightly under 2.1 quadrillion. It is. And the answer to your question is a tough one, but they have stated that they are rooting for the contraction. It's not just like they're allowing the contraction to happen for the first time since 2009. They are actually rooting for it this time because of how high inflation has, has reached. So if you read what the Fed is saying, they're talking about, we're actually hoping to see a higher unemployment number because that will bring down uh, wages, which will bring down inflation. So they're using their central bank 101 right now, which is if inflation is high, raise rates, slow the economy, bring inflation down. And when the economy is down, the central banking 101 is to lower rates, and to bring demand back up. So they are using their usual playbook or like the textbook, which is that if inflation is high, raise rates and slow the economy. But they're doing it in a way right now that, again, it it's all about their reputation. Reputation with who? The public. Hmm. Because if the Fed caves, okay, let's say we have... You're right. We've had two consecutive now monthly declines in U.S. home prices, or I think one or two. The one was zero, and then we've actually seen a nationwide month month over month decline in home prices. That means the economy is slowing, right? Inter- higher interest rates have had an effect. But if we get a few more negative home price months, or we get uh, increase in firing, or we get a slowdown in economic activity, but inflation is still high, per the Fed's own rhetoric, they will keep hiking because it's not enough. It it wasn't enough. And so that's where I think the reputation comes in is that the only thing they care about right now is the public's perception of 8% CPI. And so they'll do anything that they can to get it down. But your but if question, they crash the housing market and crash the economy, they won't be able to crash the housing market in the economy fully. And the reason is because the reason that the Fed will have to stop hiking rates is not the economy. Okay. It is internal financial plumbing and other financial metrics that will, if those break, cause depression like situations in the economy. So those are things like money market rates or corporate borrowing or what's going on in Europe. Uh, Let's say dollar funding in Europe, which is European banks trying to borrow dollars. Um, They're not able to get them. So they're having to to pay up. Uh, Emerging markets starting to break. Those are the types of things that send the financial system into like a freeze state where banks stop answering the phone when another bank calls them. That is what's going to get the Fed to stop hiking rates. And that will be a tap on the shoulder, not a, a, a you know recession headline in the Wall Street Journal or um, housing price crash um, you know, on CNBC. It's going to be something way more nuanced. It's going to be tough to predict. I think something to do with Europe. Yeah, so who brought that up previously? Somebody said that the US will have to protect Europe from crashing. That's correct. I agree yeah. with that fully. Who was it who said that? I can't remember. It might even have been Jeff. So is what you're saying there kind of what happened in a very small scale in the UK two weeks ago, whenever it was? So in the UK, it was, like like I was saying, it's hard to predict. I think that's 
that's the takeaway from what happened in the UK. You have pension funds that have all these UK government bonds, right? They're not supposed to care about mark-to-market losses because the liabilities are 30 to 50 years. But they didn't only have bonds. They had derivatives. And the derivatives, if they go down in price, remember, no money exchanged place in, on, on day one in that derivative. The bonds that they purchased, they had to wire that money. Mm-hmm. You, you don't have that money. You just have the bond. You have custody of the bond. Hold on. Is this why historically pension funds usually have quite strict rules on what they can put money into? Yes. And is this a, a relaxing of the rules that's happened in the UK specifically? I don't do know, you know the rules in the UK that yeah. allow this, but I do know that pension and life insurance funds in the United States are heavy participants in the interest rate swap market, which is the derivatives market. It's the synthetic bond market. Right. So U.S. pension funds are in the synthetic bond market. U.K. pension pun- funds are in the synthetic U.K. bond market. And synthetic, I mean by interest rate swaps, that's a derivative. It's a long, if you're a long an interest rate swap, it means you're receiving a fixed coupon, just like in a bond. Now, the difference is that you have to pay a floating coupon, which is the pretend borrow, which is like um, if you... The, the analogy is with repo. If I have a U.S. Treasury security, or let's say I want to buy a U.S. Treasury security, but I don't have any money, and I'm a bank, I can buy that security and finance the trade at the same time and basically only have to spend 2% of the bond. But I don't get the full coupon, meaning that, you know, let's say the coupon is 3%. So, sorry, for people listening, because Greg talks about coupons, but yeah. like... Help them understand what a coupon means. Yeah, a coupon. So, because uh, for us, a coupon is 20, 20p off a parcel <laughs> sure. uh, that you cut out of the paper. So, a coupon bond yeah. is a fixed income instrument. Let's call it a 10 year bond mm-hmm. with a 3% coupon. Okay. Now, in US, the coupons are paid semi annually, which means that every six months, I will get one and a half dollars on my $100 bond. For, for the like, next 10 years, yeah. so 20 payment periods. I will get one and a half, one and a half, one and a half, and at the last payment period, I'll get 100 plus one and a half. It was one of the weirdest things to get my head around when I first started to understand or uh, talk about bonds or ask people questions about bonds on the show is that uh, the idea that as the uh, as the yield goes up, that is uh, a sign of a weakening bond, uh, a weakening currency. Right. It was, it was a weird thing. I was like, but, but I'm getting more money. You're not because you, know? you purchased the bond at 3% coupon. Yeah. The next guy gets to purchase it at 4%. So your 3% coupon is worth less than his 4% because yeah. he, he gets four, he gets $2 every six months. You only get one and a half. So the guy that when rates went up from three to 4%, you lost money on your bond. Yes. So the, so back to coupon bonds, that's what a coupon is. It's the payment that comes in. Now, if I spend a hundred dollars on a bond, I'm going to get that coupon every six months for the next 10 years and then have my $100 back at the end. But if I'm in a synthetic bond position, do I just get the coupon for free? No, I have to pay a borrow rate and as if I'm pretending to finance the bond. So go back to the coupon bond analogy. If I, if I want to buy a $100 bond for 3% coupon, but I don't have $100 and I'm a bank, I can say, hey, I'm going to buy this treasury from you, but you finance it. You give me $98 to finance it. I'll give you $2 today out of my pocket. I'll get the 3% coupon, one and a half dollars every six months. But now I'll also have to pay you 2% interest rate on that $98 I've borrowed. So you have a positive carry and a negative carry. You have the 3% coupon, you'll be able to pay 2% every year to bar- for the bar. We call that the borrow. That's repo. That's what repo is. It's the borrow on the coupon security that you've purchased. So your net yield is only 1% instead of three, but you didn't spend any money to do it. Now, an interest rate swap is the same thing. You are receiving a fixed coupon and you're paying a floating coupon that changes with LIBOR over time. And you don't actually care what the difference is between the rates because you are buying that synthetic bond to get exposure to interest movements and interest rates. Like if rates go from 3% to 2%, you better own some bonds today because if they go down to 2%, 
you you wouldn't have made that money. And if you have to buy bonds next year at 2%, you just gave up 1% yield for the next 30 to 50 years. A lot of these interest rate swaps are done with a 30 to 50 year tenor. Wow. Okay, so okay. now let's go back to the UK. Mm -hmm. The UK pension plans own UK government bonds. They've paid for them in full. They also own synthetic bonds, interest rate swaps. They haven't paid for those. So when the price goes down, when rates go up, the price of those contracts goes down, what happens? Barclays calls the pension fund and says, you owe me a billion dollars. And this is why it ground to a halt and there was a risk of the funds collapsing. So how did the UK pension on day one, how did they pay for that? They sold the bonds because they paid for those bonds. So if you have, if you paid a hundred dollars for that bond, you sell that bond, you have a hundred dollars. So did they sell them, them or did they use them as like collateral? They probably sold them. Right. Because that's why the rates were going up. They were, they were selling, they were dumping them. They, yeah, there was a dump on there the There was a dump. Right. And that sent interest rates up. But you see, they were dumping the bonds themselves because their synthetic bonds were being margin called. That's the downward spiral. And that's why I the see. government stepped in and said, we will buy them. We will buy the bonds so that the price doesn't fall. Yeah. And then the synthetic bonds, the interest rate swaps, they're not necessarily pegged to the government bonds. There is a basis. I mean, there's a little difference in yield and that little difference in yield does change with little um, fundamentals in the market. But all in all, they are mostly linked to the government bond yields. So the derivatives contracts will go back up in price when the Bank of England says, okay, we're going to purchase the government bonds. Now we saw yields and gilts go from 5% down to 3.5%. And there, if you can spot check it, I, they're already back above 4% and rising. So their little intervention has been very short-lived. We see that all across central bank intervention. Interventions are very short-lived. It might require more. I don't have any explicit predictions on what's going to happen in UK government bond market. But 30-year uh, gilts are now 4%. 0.37%. So they're up like 60 basis points from the post uh, intervention lows on the yield. But does, it, does this introduce a new risk into the market that if you know the government is going to step in, that you can essentially go out and take more risk? Yes. And that is the dynamic that we're in, right? So when I talk about reputation... Of it, Nick, do you know what this is like? This is like parenting. <laughs> My son always knew I'd bail him out. Honestly, he's a wonderful boy. Financially, he's always been a little bit kind of like irresponsible. He he knows I will always bail him out. Um, and I have done. You know, and it, it hasn't been the best parenting. I've tried to teach him. It just hasn't worked. He's now away at university and he has a budget. And he has to manage that budget. And so what I'm doing is I'm reducing his budget each month to a point where he's going to get to a fixed budget, a lower fixed budget. But I ha I'm having to wean him off the, that... Uh, cheap credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in an era of cheap credit that's inflated everything we're buying. But uh, yeah, no, I'm having to wean him off the, 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 dank, the dead bank of free cheap credit. In the banking world, this is called moral hazard. Yeah. And again, like we haven't heard the phrase moral hazard in the financial media in a few years. Okay. Because the bailouts have faded, right? We're now 14 years removed from the 2008 bailouts. We're now about two years removed from QE infinity in the pandemic. This moral hazard that we're talking about is banks taking undue risk because of the guarantee of central bank bailout or because of the assumption of central bank bailout. And it's like with the FDIC. The FDIC, I know it protects it's meant what it was brought in for, but that allows the lenders to, to take more risk. Well, so the FDIC will always step in. The, um, that is true, that, but the banks pay into the insurance fund for FDIC. The banks have, the cost is on the banks. Oh, it is. I didn't know To that. fund the insurance. Right, that was never been explained to me. So it's, the FDIC is more of, I think it was 
more of a public initiative. Socializing the losses. It's it's it does socialize the losses, but what it does is it if we bring back layered money, it allows the populace to look at their third layer money as first layer money. Okay. Okay. Right. And it and it gives them the confidence that the banking system is something that will serve them. Right. It's not something that is going to um, disappear for them. Do they you need another beer. By sure. The way. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. I'm not drinking yet because I got three interviews. To do. <laughs> well, you you had Mexican beer for me, which is the appropriate beer to have for a Californian. So I couldn't say no. That's basically what happened. If you had had some European beer, I don't know if I would be as quick to hop in there. I, I, if I could have got you a European beer, I'd have got you a Leffy. But you could only have probably survived a couple. Yeah, you can't be drinking that time. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You, you ever you ever heard a uh, Leffy session? <laughs> I'd, so I got tricked on that when I was about twenty two. My old boss took me to a bar, and he was like, uh, "Do you want a Do you want a beer?" I was like, "Yeah," but it was a uh, an ale pub. And he was like, oh, you should try Leffy. I had five of them. Like, but they they only give you like a half. They're small. But it's like 8% or something. Uh, yeah, I couldn't walk. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good beer though. Tastes good. Um, okay, cool. Have we got something to finish on there? Because I've got another question. On go that. I've got a question on that as well. Oh, go. You go down. Well, my question would be, so if, is this an area where you would disagree with Jeff? Because he thinks that since 2008, the banks have not been taking anywhere near enough risk, I think. I think that's his sort of stance. I do agree with that to some degree. Banks are, especially in the US, are in a much better place than they were. And that is thanks to their own risk management, as well as law, certain laws that have changed, as well as certain market dynamics. So one of them being the clearance of interest rate swaps instead of interest rate swaps being bilateral agreements. And what that means is that all these synthetic bonds that exist in the world, uh, notionally um, to, the soon, to, to the tune of several hundred trillion dollars. Yeah, several hundred trillion dollars. This, this, the, the amount of notional interest rate swaps had surpassed one quadrillion dollars in the pre-2009 era. So all of these synthetic bonds with all these margin calls going back and forth every day are now netted and centralized in terms of the, the risk. It's uh, with a, a clearinghouse. So the CME or in Europe, um, there's the ICE or the LCH, London Clearinghouse, LCH. The risk now of all these synthetic bonds and the margin calls is centralized. So there's a ton of now risk at the clearing houses, right? CME and LCH, as well as ICE, which is the inter intercontinental exchange. So we have these three clearing houses where there's a ton of risk, but that also means that the risk is no longer on the bank's balance sheet. So when, you know, some synthetic bond holder, let's say the, the pension fund they when they get margin called and let's say the BOE didn't step in and they get margin called by Barclays if they don't pay their margin call Barclays isn't going to go bankrupt and because the money is at the clearing house the risk is there the Barclays will be able to, and bark and everyone pays into that fund also every clearing broker pays into Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the London Clearinghouse, they pay into these insurance funds to protect uh, margin calls. So let's say the BOE didn't step in last week, and let's also say that um, Barclays had the margin call risk on their book. If the UK pension fund doesn't pay Barclays their margin call, Barclays then could default to you know, another bank, daisy Cascade. chain, yeah. financial collapse. Totally possible. But in a post interest rate swap cleared world, that's not as possible. So we are not in the same place as we are in 08 from the financial system perspective. Now, I can't be the one that says the system is great, it's functioning great, there's no collapse ahead. 
I, I refuse to be that guy. My job is to try to find problems in the system and identify them. But I can, I can tell you from experience that one of the main problems in the system, which was bilateral interest rate swaps, bilateral meaning non-cleared, naked exposure from one party to the next, is not in the system anymore. And remember, that number had reached a quadrillion dollars in notional. I don't right, even which, know how you think of a number like that. Which is like ten trillion in market value. All right, the, I don't love the 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 notional one because it's super dramatic, and um and it's very like a fatalistic way to talk about things. A truly a, a quadrillion in derivatives. Well, no, but it w- still was ten trillion market value in derivatives. It's a lot of money, and if that blows up, the whole system blows up easily. So they have fixed some things that protect against uh, interbank collapse. But that doesn't mean everything is fixed. And there are different money market metrics that we use to try to see if there's funding stress in the interbank relationships, one of them being LIBOR. So where do you disagree with Jeff? Obviously on Bitcoin, we'll come to that. Yeah, I I disagree with Jeff. I think m- most specifically on his idea that the Fed is not a central bank. Okay, so he said the Fed is not a central bank. It doesn't really know what money is, and it can't really affect the economy. I take some issue with that because let's talk about the two things that the Fed can do: they can ease or they can tighten. Why do they ease? Because the economy is slowing. Why do they tighten? Because inflation is hot, right? So we don't have a ton of evidence over the last 15 years of what the Fed does when inflation is really hot. We only have about one year of data, which is the last year. And what do we know? They're, they're raising rates to bring it down. So let's talk about the easing first. This is where I would agree with him that the Fed is not able to stimulate the economy because of the euro dollar system. So let's describe like where he's accurate. When the Fed lowered rates to zero, it saw that it didn't, it wasn't able to boost demand. So it did another easing measure, which was QE. And they saw that it didn't really boost demand. Inflation was sticky. You guys had that chart up. Inflation was very low for that whole period. So what is that called? That's called a liquidity trap. When the economy is so slow that even rates down to zero don't boost it, there's nothing you there's nothing else you can do. The Fed wasn't going to send rates to negative two percent. You're out of bullets. They they were out of bullets. And why was the economy still slow? Why was inflation still slow, even though the Fed was easing? Not because they're not a central bank per se, but because the contraction in Euro dollar credit, meaning the willingness of Barclays, SockGen, BNP Paribas. Banco Santander, the willingness to issue dollar loans was not there. So the aggregate demand of the world slowed due to the contraction of the euro dollar credit system. And the Fed lowering rates to zero and doing QE, which is just creating bank reserves, didn't do anything to stimulate aggregate demand. I agree. The Fed was not a central bank that could really control money in that situation. But what's happening with hot inflation? And I know the interview is a couple months ago and inflation was you know, getting there. The Fed wasn't super aggressive at that point. But look at what the Fed has done. Well, should we remind ourselves of what Jeff said? Because I do remember this bit. He said uh, the expansion of money doesn't drive inflation. And he, ch- he showed us two periods of inflation, high inflation. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but it was post-World War II and then post-COVID. And he said... Um, these periods are periods of a, like an intense increase in demand for product services, et cetera, and that's what drives up. Not, it it, not, it, not it was actually money. supply shocks. Yeah, supply shocks, not monetary expansion. And I do agree with that. Okay. So I'm not this, uh, I don't have the, the word transitory on my hat and walk around with it um, because I think that that was uh, a little arrogant of the Fed to, to claim that it was transitory. And I actually believe that we're in... Well, a, arrogant or to soften the blow? <laughs> well, let's just say that they, they, didn't see, they didn't see this coming. 
because it wasn't in their models. Inflation runs hot when you have, uh, from the demand side, when you have more demand than supply. Mm -hmm. That means the economy is doing really well and there's not enough supply to satisfy the demand. And so prices have to go up. That is not what happened. That's why the Fed wasn't able to forecast the inflation. The inflation, in my opinion, was mostly due to the supply shocks to the economy. Same thing in the 40s where you have a post-World War II and supply chains have shut down and have to be reorganized. So you have to ratchet up prices and let everything kind of sort itself out. But again, to slightly disagree with Snyder, are you really going to say that the stimulus both fiscal and monetary at the same time didn't contribute. It had to have contributed, especially because the it wasn't just QE. Like Lynn talked about, it's QE plus the checks that went out. That is real money in people's pockets. It does boost aggregate demand and it should drive prices up. So, it, it's not just a supply shock. It's a comp complicated picture. It is a complicated picture. It's not just a supply shock. But the supply shock is, to me, the main driver. It should fade, and it is fading slowly, but it should fade, meaning the inflation should fade over the coming year plus and come back down. But are we going to go back to this 2% inflation or even lower due to a, a contracting euro dollar system and lack of confidence in the bank or lack of lending, right? Lack of willingness to lend. Way too early to say that because in a post-pandemic world, supply chains have been completely reorged and trade relationships have been reorged. So over the next couple of years, we'll get to see where does inflation come back down. But I do agree with Jeff in that there is no runaway inflation this is not driven by QE and fiscal stimulus by itself. And that inflation will come back down. And it and um I just I have a big problem with this hyperinflation narrative okay. or runaway inflation. I think it's nonsense if you look at the 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 data and you look at the QE during the 2010s with no inflation, it's really hard to say that QE is the driver of inflation. All right, as a Bitcoiner, uh, I am not a big fan of Stephanie Kelton. But is there some truth to what she says in that expanding the money supply, you know, increasing the money supply, is okay as long as you can keep infl inflation under control? And where and and where other people are perhaps wrong is where they think that this kind of monetary expansion is the cause and can lead to runaway inflation. The problem with the the Kelton and MMT thesis is that it 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 chooses to ignore math. I have a big problem with that. Yeah. Even if you want to say which okay, if you say that QE doesn't cause inflation and that high deficits also don't cause inflation, you can you, you can look at empirical data and say okay, during this period that is the truth. But what I would what I say is she would say there's an acceptable level of inflation. Now, Ovik Roy would completely disagree. And if anyone hasn't listened to our, the show we made with him, they should because we talked to him and he talked about the widening wealth gap. And he even said, look, even at 2% inflation, that has a catastrophic effect, compounding effect on the poorest in society. I think what she's saying is that you can use QE to stimulate the economy, to put checks in people's hands at, during, during times of you know, economic crisis, uh, as long as you can keep inflation under control. I don't think she's saying it doesn't cause inflation. Sure. So the the problem, again, the problem with it is that what you're doing is you're setting up this winners and losers system. And she's trying to say that there are no losers. And that, I that's the point. And I, I I really I really don't agree with that. Um, you know, it, it also comes down to central planning. A lot of Bitcoiners hate central planning and they want a world with no central planning. But is that a likely outcome for our governments over the next 10, 20 years? That they're going to give up central planning? They're not going to give it up. might be taken from them, but no. They're but not going how to would it be taken from them? I mean, look, I'd have to sit about and um, map out the scenario where... Uh, so 
the amount of times I use Bitcoin right now for my transactions uh, is more than it was a year ago. And that was more than a year before. And my experience in going to El Salvador when I went to Zonte, and I suddenly, it was like my fourth time I went there, I didn't actually go with any dollars and I didn't need them because everywhere accepted Bitcoin. And yes, it was an experiment and a bit of fun to constantly pay in Bitcoin, but at the same time, I didn't need any dollars. There will come a time where you know, I could perhaps completely exit from the traditional fiat world system because Bitcoin is so ubiquitous that I could just use it. So I see a scenario where like over time it can cause an erosion. Do I think it will happen? No, but I can see a scenario where it does. And I I mean I agree with you in that there is an erosion, but it's so marginal that it doesn't have a material effect on the dollar or the US government's um goal of central planning. Just the way that politics have evolved to where they are. There's just there's there will always be central planning. But yeah, but maybe it will change. It may be it may be in a scenario whereby we are we have reached this layered money world which is built on Bitcoin that they act more like companies because yeah I talk about this all the time, Nick. If I want to take a loan, I have to pay it back. If my company wants to take a loan, I have to pay it back. The government doesn't have to do that. They can take out loans, they don't have to pay it back. But in a Bitcoinized world, they can't do that. No, the, the money they spend they, on their centrally planned projects will have to come from uh, uh, taxation. It, it can't come from deficit spending because they won't be able to deficit spend. So th- th- then I think what it becomes is more like parties become more like companies and you have a choice of who, which company you want to live under. And, I, I, you know, it took me a long time to get to that. It's a thesis that might completely not play out, but I see it. Yeah, and I don't think that fractional reserve banking is going anywhere. And so the because it's too easy for the government to finance itself without like a sound, sound, sound money standard or having to collect all the tax revenue, it's too easy for them to politically do it. And so that's why I view that that situation will continue and that Bitcoin and Bitcoin's price will be continue to be a check on that system. Uh-huh. And so when it rises too much, the central banks have to fight back. Right, and okay. that is my thesis about, okay, sitting here and claiming that Jay Powell saw 70,000 in November 21 and said, I have to hike rates. It's, it's a little bit of hyperbole, right? But my point here is that they have to respond to what they're seeing. And so if they see their reputation crumbling, they have to fight to protect it. And it doesn't mean going to a non-fractional reserve system. It could just mean increasing reserve requirements, increasing real interest rates, and um, and proving that they're here to not just be easy monetary policy, but they could actually do tight monetary policy. And what is it doing to the dollar? The dollar is at multi-decade highs, absolutely raging versus every other currency. So what death of the dollar? This is the most ridiculous claim that I hear is that we're in for the death of the dollar versus what? Hmm. Versus what no, it's is fair. It's fair. what it what death of the dollar? The dollar is at 20 year highs versus every other currency. Gold isn't even close to its all time high, which is supposed to be a check on the dollar. And um, Bitcoin is really the only thing that if you take it back uh, over a long enough time horizon that it's actually outperforming the dollar. But over the last five years, Bitcoin is actually flat versus the dollar. Five years? 2017 peak, where that was 20,000. We're at 20,000 today. So if Bitcoin is at 20,000 in December of this year, it'll be flat for five years. Huh. Fair. Yeah, fair. So what yeah. death of the dollar? And I'm not like this pro-dollar, anti-Bitcoin guy. No, you've been a realist. Yeah. It's a realism. It. And it is, you also look at the percentage of global trade denominated in dollars. You look at, you know, Santiago Capital on Twitter. You guys check him out. He has the dollar milkshake theory. It's also called the dollar wrecking ball theory. This is the correct theory. The dollar should be knocking off every other currency. Why? Layered money. It's the top of the stack. Every other fiat currency is a shit coin versus the dollar. 
I mean, U.S. has its property law, tax revenue, and its 300 million citizens as collateral against its debt and its currency, right? It's theoretical, but it's there. Mm-hmm. What does the rest of the world have? Jack shit. I mean, they have some oil, right? There, there, there are natural resources around the world. There's some intellectual property, but where does all the capital innovation go? It goes to the United States. It, it, it has, and it will continue to, that will support the dollar versus other currencies as people have demand for dollar denominated assets. They have demand for property that is protected by US property law and the court system in the United States is still the strongest in the world. I, hmm? US, the U, my pro US stance in, is a relative stance versus property law across the world. Okay, fair. And that, that dynamic, the difference, the delta between the property law in the United States and the willingness to let entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs, which isn't legislated per se, it's more in the culture of the country, yes. but it's legislated in a way that means that not everything is legislated, right? We will, we will choose to have laws that are either vague or not there or only state level so that, we can, so that you guys can do whatever you want. Pro-innovation. Pro-innovation. Yeah. All of those things spell a very strong future for the dollar relative to other currencies. Now, Bitcoin will be a referendum on the dollar over a long time, but look at the last five years, Bitcoin is flat. Yeah, I mean, look, yes, it is flat. Um, I still think we're very early in Bitcoin. I do too. And, I'm not bearish Bitcoin. And, and, and point to point, we've gone from 20 to 20, but really we've gone from a, a, a spike up to 20 in a very short period of time to a, to a stabilization around 20. So that's a two, to me, they're two 20, very different 20,000s. And if you want to say 2017 to 2022, and you want to go five years, well, we're in, where are we now? October? Mm-hmm. We, the run-up was November? Maybe it was 16, maybe it was 15, 17. You know, you can pick point to point and choose your, your period of time, but... Yes, and I, the 200-week exactly. moving average of Bitcoin has never decreased week over week. It's going up consistently. It's above $20,000. At the Bitcoin layer, we have our uh, we have our TBL fair valuation framework. We have three different components to this confluence price that we believe is Bitcoin's fair value. It takes into account 200 week moving average, which is up a lot since 2017. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes into account the realized price, which is an on-chain metric used to estimate cost basis of long positions. We also use the input cost. So like uh, we use the data from Riot and we look at their cost for miners, electricity, um, et cetera, and what it costs to produce Bitcoin. So what, what is a fair price? Yeah, so right now it's about 20, 22,000. Okay. Right? And in terms of a fair price. And when we see historically that Bitcoin below a ratio of one on this fair value ratio that we have at the Bitcoin layer. Do you buy the shit out of it? It's a buy. It's a long. I mean, and so I'm very bullish on Bitcoin over really any time horizon. Right. I don't think that Bitcoin is going much lower and I think it's going much, much higher. But I'm presenting some counterfactuals about the death of the dollar. Yeah, I know. I get it. I get it. Okay. And, and, and so I completely agree with you that today's 20,000 is different than 2017's. Also, the, just the adoption levels are higher. Um, Bitcoin as a network is much more robust. It has Lightning Network now. There's a lot of properties that make Bitcoin really future built and future proofed. And that's why you want to be in that position. But talking about the death of the dollar being the reason to buy Bitcoin is, it's a little off to me. Um, Danny's deeper into the money side than me. Um, and, uh, but it gives the show another dynamic, another it does. personality. It does. It makes it feel better. I, yeah. The foil, you're the yeah, foil. Your voice <laughs> comes across great. I was telling Danny that. Danny what? has a fan as well. We have one fan. He's got an actual <laughs> fan. He's yeah. got two fans. <laughs> no, but like a real fan, yeah. like a slightly... We recorded this. He's is it like, a female? No, it's a no. dude. But like, he loves Danny. He like every video. And I love Derek. <laughs> every Derek video, S. Every, every, like every episode we put out on YouTube, Derek comes on, he's a comment, but they're like super fuck. What the, what's the kind of shit he says? They're so funny. They started off, he must do a lot of acid or something. <laughs> they started off like so bizarre, but he always compares me to someone, doesn't he? 
He always says like, he made one comment about how I've got no hair and he's like, Danny's better than Lex Luthor or something. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's almost like he's on acid and he talks about like, Danny's come fr from the future, intergalactic future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some weird shit. Should yes. we make his day, Danny? I fucking look, love Derek S. Look, look I at, love look. you, Derek S. <laughs> <laughs> Wave to Derek. <laughs> we should get you a t-shirt. I love Derek. <laughs> yeah, uh, Danny's got, Danny's brilliant. Danny's been a great addition to the show and I love having him here. It's part of it. He, he basically runs it. The show is Danny. I know. <laughs> yeah. I've been a guest many times. <laughs> if I was to walk uh, out of here and get hit by a bus or have a heart attack or something that would take me from this planet the show would continue with danny and half the americans wouldn't even notice <laughs> <laughs> the, the, only the ones listening yeah <laughs> uh, it would be an infinitely uh, better show probably he's more handsome he's taller he's basically he's carrying me to be honest. um all right so god what have we done we've done two hours already okay a couple more things i wanted to get into you, with you uh i'm gonna get into the bitcoin side of things um Jeff doesn't says he doesn't believe in Bitcoin, but then when he describes perfect money, he describes Bitcoin. He says the best form of money should be stable, predictable, transparent. We all know the rules, no information asymmetries. So if anyone said that, you'd say, oh, you describe a Bitcoin. But then he says the problem with Bitcoin is it's inelastic, and that's his issue with it. But then he says we should have two forms of money, which is uh, one is a store of value and one's a medium of exchange. And I kind of agree with him in, in aspects, but we have that now anyway. We have our store of value in Bitcoin or even houses or stocks if you want them, and we have the dollar. So I don't understand why, what the hurdle is that he can't get over. Do you? Do you, do you have a thesis on it? A little bit. So one component here is that the stable value or stability of the system. So Bitcoin is an incredibly stable system within itself. But when you try to use it as currency in a cross-border situation, every economic actor has input costs and those input costs might go across varying currencies. So when you think about Bitcoin as a stability instrument in an environment which you have to do a lot of Forex transactions, then it loses that stability. And unless you have a proper hedge, at every point of exchange, you are now exposed to the price volatility of Bitcoin relative to what your suppliers will accept as currency. So from that perspective, Bitcoin is not ready to step in as the global currency. That's, right? the, that's the word though, not ready. Right, not ready. Um, if Bitcoin's exchange rate stabilizes versus other currencies, or just the simple uh, evolution of Bitcoin being adopted so that the supplier will accept Bitcoin instead of having to swap it into Euro or whatever, that that can, that can lead to a system in which Bitcoin is used more. And I think that's what you were talking about with going to El Zante and um, you know, using Bitcoin around the world. We're not there yet, not even really close, but I think that's one of the hurdles that he sees. It's, it's a pocket that exists that didn't before. Yeah. I also have some of my invoices. I've got two sponsors that pay in Bitcoin. Um, because of my business margins, I can afford to keep that in Bitcoin, and I do. Uh, and so the, these like little transitionary steps exist. Uh, I think it, as an individual, it's quite easy to do this, especially if you've done four years, five years. Um also, if it's uh, you're a company and small company, it's easier to do. You know, if you're successful and you've got that buffer, I think, as you said, for even nation states, it's probably a little bit easier. But like certain companies can't take this risk. You know, we saw that with Tesla; they ended up, yeah, you know, Elon Musk lost lost his bottle and they they sold all of their Bitcoin, the majority of their Bitcoin, I think three quarters of it. Yeah. So like, whereas someone like Sailors like fuck this, I'm going all in. So we've seen massive progress. And my view is that we will keep chipping away at that. Yes. But I don't know if it, we're 5, 10, 50 years away from the future. So should we actually get your future layered money? Let's do it. The future world, the Bitcoin world. I mean, I, I, you give me a smile. I don't know if you're because you're thinking, no, it's fucking here, Pete. What are you on about the future? Yeah, this, this is the one that's the Bitcoin only ecosystem. Love. You should get this as a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> This is why Bitcoin and the dollar are not a good comparison, Pete. 
Yeah. It's it, it, they do coexist today and they will coexist in the future because you need elasticity governments themselves need elasticities to survive because of the cycle. So that's why they're not going to relinquish their own currency, their own central banks and their ability to engage in elasticity. It will never ever go away. And in Bitcoin, we have an option to hold an inelastic asset. And that is our choice. And that the price of that asset will fluctuate relative to other things that are influenced by elasticity. So Bitcoin price is the signal that we have to give us a sense of, is, it, is the dollar system too elastic or is it inelastic right now? But the whole debate about Bitcoin being inelastic and if it was a little bit more elastic, it could serve as a better currency system for the world. It's a little silly. It look would just at, become. Yeah, just look at it today, and that's how I see it. Bitcoin is an asset. People own it. They, It's a hedge for them against whatever they think it's a hedge for. <laughs> Maybe they're trying to hedge the dollar. Maybe they're trying to hedge their uh, real wages falling. I don't know. Everyone has their own reason for buying Bitcoin, and that's an asset. The dollar has its own system, elasticity, it needs that elasticity. We'll continue to have that elasticity. When economies go into contraction, the government wants to re-stimulate. They do that with fiscal and or monetary stimulus. That needs elasticity. And that situation will continue to exist. So, you know, him criticizing Bitcoin for being inelastic, it assumes that Bitcoin could just step in and be that dollar currency system. But that's not really the way that I see it. Okay, can you explain this pyramid to people who can't see it? Although we can say, please go buy Nick's book. Layered money, yes. layered bullet, all good retailers. Yeah, so what you have right here is a layered money pyramid with Bitcoin at the top. And this is, a bit, this is the Bitcoin ecosystem. So some of the actors that hold a lot of Bitcoin on their asset side which would put Bitcoin as the first layer of money and whatever liabilities as the second layer of money include exchanges and actors in the private sector like Fidelity Digital Assets, for example, or NIDIC. Yeah. These are companies that own Bitcoin as their asset and then they've issued Bitcoin deposits or Bitcoin claims to their customers. So if you have, uh, who's your uh, exchange sponsor? Well, Gemini is, Gemini. Your, is your football club sponsor. Mm -hmm. So Gemini has Bitcoin on their asset side. Right, They actually own the Bitcoin. They have their own vaults, cold storage mechanisms. Um, the Winklevi don't control the keys themselves is what we've been told. So they have these assets in Bitcoin or they are the assets are Bitcoin. And then when you have your Gemini account and you see one spot five Bitcoin on the screen in your account, that Bitcoin is not yours. It's Gemini's. You only have a claim. Gemini does let you withdraw. And within 10 minutes, that Bitcoin can be yours. It will go out of their asset side. Their liabilities will also drop as they no longer have that claim. And that Bitcoin is yours. So, uh, you know, another example would be um, stable coins, for example. So I actually believe that even though stable coins are linked to the dollar, that they have an asset like Tether, for example, has dollar assets. We know that Tether owns short-term debt. They own some treasury bills, for example. So they have dollars. Then they have USDT that they've issued. I actually believe that that USDT is as much a derivative of Bitcoin as it is the dollars that Tether holds. And that's because of the way that Tether and Bitcoin Bitcoin are exchanged for each other on exchanges like Bitfinex. Mm -hmm. So in that way, the dollar stable coins are actually subservient to Bitcoin in this digital hierarchy of money. And over time, I believe that if enough money becomes digital at the commercial bank and central bank level, that the price mechanism between these two will gravitate 
a lot towards Bitcoin being sort of the anchor of the system. And that's the idea of Bitcoin being the first layer of money of the future, especially when the Fed issues FedCoin and FedCoin, if FedCoin yeah. can be swapped for Bitcoin in a decentralized way, we'll get the true price of the dollar relative to Bitcoin in that scenario. So that's a long-term vision for how Bitcoin rises up to be the first layer of money across the world. But, you know, right now the dollar is still like the Fed. They're still focused on protecting their reputation. They're focused on renewing some of the sound money narrative, I guess, from the public. And if they continue to raise interest rates and don't cave and just do QE again, they will continue to be awarded for that with a stronger dollar versus other currencies. Not necessarily Bitcoin, but just versus other currencies. All right. In a world where we've got massive increase in adoption of Bitcoin, how much risk do you think there is of uh, a credit system based on Bitcoin? Now, the reason I bring this up is, again, my understanding of credit has changed more recently in that you know you and I can create credit with each other. You can't ban credit. Okay, so in a Bitcoin world, I oh, also I recently uh, had a guy on from Sam Sam Abassi mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Hoseki. Yep, great company, great idea. If I want to take out a mortgage, uh, the bank wants to know I've got assets. I have Bitcoin. I want to show them my Bitcoin, but I don't want to send it to them through Hoseki. I can prove it, which is great. Um, so they would obviously uh, they would loan me the money for a. Uh, a uh, house and based on that, which is great. But is do we have a do we risk a scenario where people will create exactly the same on top of Bitcoin? It's the exact same credit bubble on top of Bitcoin. The answer to that question comes down to your let's say your Barclays deposit, your Wells Fargo deposit, and your Federal Reserve note paper money. If I go to the barista and I give them a $10 bill for coffee and a muffin, and then, I, and then the next customer taps their credit card for coffee and a muffin, the barista sees the same money. Dollars one way, dollars another way. But if you go and buy a coffee with Bitcoin, and you tap your Lightning wallet, and you send you know, a few thousand sats for that coffee. The next guy, if he opens up his Gemini wallet and he tries to pay you in Gemini Bitcoin, my point is here that the Starbucks looks at the Gemini Bitcoin and they're like, what's that? I don't recognize that. So you would have to have a synthetic Bitcoin that has some sort of confidence across the world. So let's say 10 large Bitcoin exchanges came together and they said, we're going to start our own spreadsheet, our own Euro dollar, our own Euro Bitcoin, right? Yeah. An offshore Bitcoin means not on the blockchain, an off blockchain Bitcoin. That Bitcoin token is just that it's a token with a different name because it won't settle to your Lightning wallet. No, I, I mean something slightly different, Nick. Okay. So uh, I go and take out this loan um, and I prove through Hoseki, I prove I've got my Bitcoin, right? And the bank lends me it. The bank themselves may use that Bitcoin that I've got as collateral themselves. Yes. So that kind of credit bubble where that Bitcoin is now being posted as collateral multiple times. And when the system goes into shock, who has the claim to that Bitcoin? That is a good point. And that could definitely happen. I mean, look, I, I say that and then I'm asking it because the, the, the difference is, is that the first, I, I just don't think the multiple claims happen because you have the multiple hops. Yeah. My bank has a direct relationship with me and a direct claim to my Bitcoin. That's the first hop. If they then post that as collateral, they're not posting Hoseki because it's not theirs. It's mine. That's what I think I'm getting to. But then there are other risks in that 
Danny needs to uh, get a mortgage. I lend him some Bitcoin. He posts that to Hoseki. He gets his mortgage. And then he sends it back to me. So I still think there's risks. And I, like anyone who thinks that Bitcoin completely uh, cleans up credit risk, I think is wrong. Because I don't think you can get rid of credit. And I still think you have credit risk. Yeah. And I will go back to the synthetic Bitcoin because the synthetic Bitcoin would have to gain acceptance in the world. And it would have to come from sort of like a... Um, a committee of of exchanges and all that 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 try to lend Bitcoin synthetic Bitcoin out. But if you're talking about just Bitcoin itself yeah. being collateral in the system and being pledged to multiple places, that's definitely a risk. But the the default is going to be in dollars. Let's say because if you post your Bitcoin to a bank and borrow money from your house, they're not going to send you synthetic Bitcoin. They're going to send yeah. you dollars. Yeah. And so the dollar loan can default. They'll claw your Bitcoin away because it was the collateral. And there is this rehypothecation risk, which is, I think, what you're talking yeah. about, that it gets posted different places. But there's a different dynamic in that it's not Bitcoin that is being lent out. Yes, the dollar still. So that's and so really when just it the contracts, asset. it's the dollar system that contracts. And the collateral remains whatever the collateral is. In this situation, it's Bitcoin. But I think Bitcoin... It's also why I believe that fractional reserves uh, systems will continue long after Bitcoin, as they have, right? Fractional reserve exists today. It'll exist in 10 years. Bitcoin isn't going to rid the world of fractional reserve. It's not. I know that that's like a hope and dream for Bitcoiners, but it's not. There's too much behavioral and anthropological evidence that humans are always willing to do these credit systems. I think Nick, Nick Carter wrote about that, didn't he? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. And Lynn Alden yeah. talked about the uh, network of bankers a thousand years ago in the Middle Ages across Europe and across the Silk Road as a credit system. Yeah. That will always exist. Yeah. You'll always have a world of promises and then you'll always have these scarce assets that people use as store of value across generations. And Bitcoin has entered that realm of a good store of value across generations, even with only 14 years of history. It's already proving that it's on that, it's on that track. I think that's one of the most bullish things about Bitcoin is its properties are known. They're well known. The speculation of what it can do in the future is up for debate. But what it is today, I think it's, it's really being uh, cemented. Anything you want to add, Danny? No, that's been a great show. Uh, Nick, please tell everyone again about the Bitcoin layer, where to go. We will put it all in the show notes. Um, but yeah, please tell people where to go to find out more, where to buy some swag. Yeah, the BitcoinLayer.com is where you'll find all of our links. So we have our Substack publication. That is our uh, research newsletter that we put out twice a week, three times a week, actually. Uh, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. We have a YouTube channel also called the Bitcoin Layer. Um, that we're putting out videos twice a week, covering some of our Substack articles, as well as uh, some market chats. And we're going to get into some interviews with some great macro minds. I'm thinking guest lectures, people that come in and help me uh, explain to the students or the listeners what we're looking at. And uh, the merch uh, link is also available uh, there. So the bitcoinlayer.com, you guys can find everything. Go subscribe to our Substack, go subscribe to the YouTube and uh, maybe grab yourself a hoodie or a hat. Good work, brother. Well, I'll be wearing my hat tomorrow. Uh, thanks, man. You crushed it. I love this. Thanks, Pete. Amazing. Great to be here, man. And uh, I'm not sure where I'll see you, see you next uh, because you're not going to be at Pack Bitcoin. Um, I don't know. We'll figure something out. We'll figure it out. All right, brother. Keep doing it. Keep crushing. And yeah, see you soon. Thanks, Pete.